Well, good evening, folks. Pastor Pete here at Downsview Baptist Church. First time we've been here on a Wednesday evening in some time, and sure glad to be back again. One of the things that we try to do in the various aspects of our ministry, and one of the things we've been seeking to do in particular over this last month or so, is to live out as by God's grace, as best we can, I'm almost not sure I like that as best we can, but as God leads to live out John 13, 34, that we are to love one another the way Christ has loved us. And where Christ has been sacrificial, Christ has been intimate, where Christ has been intentional, as we saw on Sunday morning with his love towards us, then we're seeking to do that one to another again, even this evening. Let me just make sure that we're online here as uh, we're supposed to be, and then we'll get into this. Actually seems to work okay. There we are. Good. And then we'll... So we'll certainly be glad if you would let me know if you're here and when you're here. And uh, if you have a moment, hit the like button on the bottom of the video. I'm reminded that it does something for our reach. And if you can think of the same thing when you see our YouTube channel and you see the daily videos or even the Sunday morning videos, if you haven't subscribed, click on that. Again, some advantage for us. I'm not sure all the details, but I'm happy to take the reasoning of, of other folks on that. So tonight we are going to have a few announcements and a few thoughts to bring us up to date on things a little bit happening with our church. And then we are going to have a special opportunity to look at the relationship between the church and civil government. And I'm using the resources of a colleague in the gospel of mine, a man named Wyatt Graham who is the executive director of the Gospel Coalition in Canada. And so he's allowed me to use his material. I was struck by it a while back. And in fact, now that I think of that, I was going to put the link to his, um, his broader article will be here. If you look under the title of our unit here, it says Congregational Connection and let's see here, let's see if I can put it in there. Well, I can put it in the comments at least. So there it is. So you should be able to find that easily enough in the comments bar and have a look there and you should be able to uh, get again the, the full article that's that's there. We'll use some of the details there. As I usually say, whenever I have uh, someone who is uh, material I'm using, the parts that are really clear are his, and the parts that are a bit muddy are my effort to interpret his. So it's there in the comments bar. You can just copy that and take a look at that in the Facebook post. Hi, Ranillo. Good to have you here, brother, faithfully again. I wasn't sure how many people would know that this was on tonight, so thanks for coming. Hey, Gabrielle. I uh, was watching your family shovel yesterday, and... <laughs> Your kids and your, you got your wife out there and you were on the other end of the uh, cell phone. That doesn't usually work that way, does it? It's usually probably uh, you're on the other end of the shovel, but uh, glad to have you, Gabriel. Glad you guys are, are able to meet with us tonight as well. And so a couple of uh, details as we kind of move into our, our, our time together tonight. As you know, our province is on the move and we are on the move towards some more reopening again. And very grateful for that because uh, we've been down, and I don't know about you, but this second lockdown has has been feeling a little more weighty to me. It feels like it's been a little more difficult. And I'm really glad to see that there's been a level of compliance by our province, and the numbers are going down, and the vaccination numbers are going up, the death numbers are going down, the numbers of people in the ICU are being reduced. 
So by God's kindness and in God's providence, we're moving in the right direction. Even last weekend, a number of our Feb Central churches in Eastern Ontario, the far Eastern Ontario, uh, were able to open. Uh, they were actually open to the 30%. And this coming Sunday, a number of places, in fact, most churches around Ontario are able to open again this Sunday. Peel and Toronto and York, I think it is, uh, three of our regions right here in the hot spot. We've got at least another week or so. We don't know any dates yet, so please don't come to church until we tell you. But we're very glad that these things are, are moving forward. I want to continue to pray for our politicians. Doug Ford is our premier. Mayor John Tory is our mayor here. And Justin Trudeau is our prime minister, of course. Dr. David Williams, the Ontario Medical Officer for Health. Dr. Tam, the National or Federal Officer for Health. Elaine de Villa who is our public officer of health here in Toronto. Continue to pray for them to see that things are moving forward, but we're sure glad of the direction of things. Ah, there's Minda, you're there too as well. Got two different computers in the Sargento household, but that's really good, Minda, glad to have you join us as well tonight. So one of the things that we've done over the last while is been appealing to the government, and we'll talk about that a little more in our teaching session later, but both our denomination or our fellowship of churches, Feb Central, the fellowship of evangelical Baptist churches, even here in central region of Canada, all of Ontario and about 14 or 15 English speaking churches that are in Quebec. We have been appealing to the government that they would allow us to be open. And even during under the gray level, you remember there's those different levels that the uh, province has in terms of um, severity and, and what things can be open or not. We are hopeful. Uh, we've appealed to them through uh, Feb Central, through the Gospel Coalition Canada, an excellent article that was written there and, and, and put forward. And so we're hopeful that in the coming weeks, and we'll need a little while probably to get our heads on straight around here, but there's every reason to expect that in the relatively short while, we'll be able to be open again. Hey, Ark, glad to have you come. Glad to see how we're able to have some crepes or pancakes with the little Ava the other morning. That's excellent. I always say about the uh, parenting that, you know, you may miss a lot of soccer games, but if you're the guy who sees a lot of school plays and you may miss some tucking in at night, but not many guys get the Monday morning waffles and you've got the freedom in your business to do that. So good for you, a good example, brother, for you to even take that. Let me just check here, gang. Hey, there's Raphael. Hello, brother. You guys from Scarborough are there. I'm just making sure that no one else has uh, come on or is looking for the link and they can't seem to find it. Looks like everybody's here that wants to be here so far. So that's good. I'm, I'm getting used to this again, watching you come in on the, on the chat. But again, glad that God has been kind to answer our prayers. And I hope that we will again be able to come back together again. We're having a deacons meeting tomorrow night on Zoom again. We appreciate you folks praying for us with that as we look at the details of what it might look like uh, in particular uh, when we get back together. Uh, I think you saw this on here. Our, our Wednesday evening Zoom call has been moved to Sundays. And so we're able to do that at noon right after the morning service. So our worship's at 11, we're still keeping it to an hour, so you're used to that. I think there's only uh, so much time people can watch the, the screens nowadays, so we're trying to keep the service to one hour and then 45 minutes to an hour again afterwards on Zoom, which has just been this great interaction. Now we moved that from this time slot to Sunday morning because we thought, well, let's, let's ask the people and everybody was excited about it. And then we've seen more people that whose faces we hadn't seen for a while on Sunday morning rather than on Wednesday evening. So in God's kindness, he seems to have led us in that. It's been good. And that's why we're renewing this again. Tyrell, welcome brother. Tyrell is my new brother. We haven't met yet, but he has moved to Pineland Baptist Church out in Burlington. And he's moved from South Africa, if you please. Uh, crazy time of year to come here, brother, but uh, glad that uh, you're hanging out with us as well tonight, brother. Good to, good to have you close to us. As you know, friends, if you need 
sort of a hub of information or to find our media, to find in particular our Sunday morning services or Wednesday evening or our daily videos, just make this your hub, downsviewbaptistchurch.com. That's the spot. This is what the website looks like. We've still got our Christmas picture up there, but some folks are saying, I wasn't sure how to find the link for Sunday morning. It's right there. That arrow is not usually there, but it's there right at the top of it. Live stream Sundays at 11. Now, whether we have a live stream through Facebook, which we've done the last couple or three Sundays, or we do a pre-recorded service that's already on our YouTube channel, if you go here, you will click on this and it will take you to my personal Facebook page, the same place you're watching this now tonight, and you'll find either the service or you'll find a link. And one of the things that I think was difficult, and I wish I could show, I should have tried to get a better picture on here, but when you go to Facebook, when you're just like the video you're watching now, before it starts, there's a great big play sign, you know that little inverted V uh, triangle on the side there that says play. You've got to click that for the service to start. And I think some of the folks are getting a little caught up saying, I can't get it, I can't get it. If you go to my, my Facebook page and it's live streaming, you just click on there, you're in. Give it a couple of minutes, there's a little bit of delays, there is now, but you'll find it there. If not live stream, there'll be a link there to our YouTube channel and it'll just say premiering now or uh, click here for the Sunday morning service. Just do that and it'll take you again directly to our YouTube channel. If during the week you wanted to hit this media tab, if you were looking for the service, maybe you missed it on Sunday or you were looking for one of our Facebook lives or our rel relatively uh, semi-daily devotional videos that we're calling ponderings for our wanderings right now. We used to call them touching base and same spot we went through the Proverbs in January. This media tab has a direct link to our YouTube channel and everything in chronological order is right there for you. Everything since last March when we began this. Can you believe that? It is the 17th already. We are two weeks away, three weeks away from a full year <laughs> from the first time we shut down down I just, I just absolutely cannot get over it. But there's your hub. That's the spot. Sunday mornings, click on live stream. Any other time, click media and you'll find it there. With respect to our Sunday morning services, you know, we have been so incredibly blessed that this ministry of music through Sovereign Grace Ministries has been giving us their music, professionally done, God-centered, Christ-saturated music videos for us to worship along with at no charge. This is one of the few ministries that's done this. We mentioned others and we will continue to give thanks for them, but tonight this is the one we're giving thanks to. And thanks to God for, for them. Bob Coughlin, of course, leads this ministry for 30 plus years now. He is an elder at Sovereign Grace Church in Louisville, Kentucky, where the ministry is now headquartered the last 10 years or so. He also has a, a podcast and a ministry of Worship Matters. There's a book named almost that, I think that's the name of it, um, Christ-Centered Worship. But you know, when he leads these things, they not only compose their own music with the, the lyrics as well as the music, they just love to sing. I mean, they love to sing because they love to worship their God in songs. Does that sound like anyone? It sounds like you, Downsview. You recall last, uh, or our last anniversary, I mentioned to you again that, that first Easter Sunday morning, the first time Pam and I came as guests to the church just to start to get to know each other, to see how much this church family loves to worship the Lord in song. And, and when I tell this to other churches, you gotta understand, they go, oh yeah, everybody does. No, I was at other churches that had phenomenal musicians and phenomenally gifted singers who loved to sing. No other church like this. My buddy Steve, who plays the guitar every once in a while, has said exactly the same thing. And he's involved in two of those uh, uh, other three churches as well as a worship leader. So he knows even from the front how much we enjoy doing that. So I just want to give thanks to God for a ministry like this that is so kind. And I want to encourage you, check out their website at Sovereign Grace Music. There are all kinds of music videos that you can download. You can download their music there. Um, however people do music nowadays, I just seem to download it on my phone and, and there it is. But if, if you want a CD, to have an actual copy in your house, you can certainly do that as well. So give thanks to God for Bob Coughlin and the music ministry there. Ah, there you are, Grant. I'm looking for you, brother. Glad you and Bev were able to be there. Maybe David or Jane and Cindy and Joel, maybe others are, are watching on there as well, but thank you very much. Ah, looks like Gladys is coming on there. I'm going to uh, 
give this link, excuse me, friends. Let me see if I can do this real quick. I want to send the, send the link over to, to Gladys. We'll see if she's able to, able to get on. There it is. Hopefully you'll just click on there, Gladys, and it will be all set for you. So, okay, we're on there. This is how we do this, folks. As you know, this is a ministry in particular of Downsview Baptist Church, and we want our church family to be connected here. Grateful for Tyrell and others who come in and watch, and we're part of this, but this is not supposed to be some new internet sensation apart from our church family. This is what we're trying to be about tonight. And so, we are going to mix, uh, mention, or I've already mentioned that what we're trying to do tonight is to look at the relationship between the church and civil government. And I'm using, with much thanks, the material that is on the link in the comment bar there from Wyatt Graham. This is Wyatt and his wife, Leanne. Wyatt is the executive director of the Gospel Coalition Canada. It is headquartered at West Highland Baptist Church in Hamilton, where John Mahaffey is the senior pastor. Why it has a blog, Faith, Books, and Culture, and as I was trying to look for it, there's two or three others. So there's a number of ministries that he has there. You can just find him at wyattgram.com. Pretty easy uh, to find on the internet there. Or just go to the Gospel Coalition, and you'll also see that he has his own page there as well. He is a godly young man, He's a young man, but he has a PhD from Southern Baptist Seminary and is accessible and readable. I can understand him, and yet he can work with and walk with the scholars out there as well. So it's a real blessing for us to have him as part of our coalition of gospel believers in Canada, and in particular to have him close to us here, even in Southern Ontario. But we will begin not with a word from Wyatt Graham, but a word from the Word as he would have us do, of course. And so take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 13. I mean, I know, big surprise, right? Where would we start if we are thinking about uh, an issue with respect to government? And so turn to uh, Romans, chapter 13, and we will look into the word tonight after we ask God's help. So would you pray with with me, please, friends? So Father in heaven, it's our great joy to be together again, live together on a Wednesday evening and to have the opportunity to again worship you over your word. We want, Heavenly Father, for our lives to be lives that are reflective of your love towards us and therefore our love towards each other your sacrificial, your intimate, and your intentional love for us, dear God, is how you've loved us. And you have said, just like this, I want you to love others just as I have already loved you. And so, dear God, our only hope for that is that we continue to focus on and delve into and to enjoy the reality of your love and your care, your undeserved favor towards us, so that out of that, dear God, we can love each other like that. And so guard us from being self-centered and lacking in sacrifice. Guard us from being distant rather than intimate with each other. Guard us from only uh, reacting rather than taking action in the love relationship that we have with each other and, and, and be intentional about that. And as we do that, even tonight, dear God, as we have opportunities to pray for one another and think towards the sanctification that is your will for our lives, I pray that we would be equipped tonight to love one another better than we have and that it would be because we've met with you and that we would be quick to thank you for it. And so with humility in our hearts, we humbly do ask your help tonight in Christ's name. Man. All right, friends, let's have a look here. And as you know, I have the Bible here. Generally, I like to put the words up to at least our foundation scripture on the screen so that it's easy for us to look at together. So I'm going to read off the, the screen, but do be sure that you have a copy of the scripture there and follow along as best you can. Book of Romans, the Apostle Paul writing to this church at Rome says in verse 1 of chapter 13, let 
every person be subject to the governing authorities. Four, why should we do that? Why should we submit ourselves to the governing authorities? There is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. It's from God, it's been instituted by God. So the subject to governing authorities, the only authority there is, is from God, has been instituted by God. That's why we should obey it. Therefore, in light of that, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, what God has instituted, what has come from God. That's the flow of the argument. And those who resist, anyone who resists, and those who do resist will incur judgment. We don't like that. Some people call it unfair. Some people have gone so far on the internet just today to call it unjust when people are not submitting to the lawful governing authorities and there is judgment or consequences, even lawful consequences because of that. And so let's, let's just let the flow of the argument tell us what to do. Those who resist should expect to incur judgment. Four, why is that? Rulers, governing officials, right? I'm using a different word here. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. If you are doing bad conduct, what? Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Well, then do what is good and you'll have his approval. Of course, not always. Of course, not always in every situation. But these are the basic parameters that are being laid out. So if you want the approval of the governing authorities who are there to reward good and punish bad, then do what is good and you should expect to receive the approval. For he is God's servant for your good. We're going to look at that in a minute. It's almost impossible to believe in some senses. But he's God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. There's legitimate, physical, police-like powers that the state has to force us to conform or punish us when we don't conform. That's what he's saying. For he is, who is? He does not, who's the he? Go back. He is God's, who's, who's the he? Then do what is good and you will see his, who's, who is this? Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? So from this point forward, who's in, you'll receive the one who's in authority's approval. He, the one who's in authority, is God's servant for your good. Do what is good and you'll receive the one who's in authority's approval. He's God's servant for your good. For if you do what is wrong, be afraid for the one in authority does not bear the sword in vain. For the one who is in authority is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. It's God's discipline. It's God's punishment. It's the consequences that come from God. They don't originate with the governing authorities. They originate with God. Therefore, Verse 5, we must be in subjection. Why? Not only to avoid God's wrath, so we don't want these consequences, but also for the sake of conscience, for developing an inner sense of right and wrong and the integrity to act in line with right and wrong. Sorry, my throat's giving me the difficulty. That's why I keep doing this, just to see who's here. Elizabeth Gutierrez, the whole family's coming on there tonight. Good to see you, Elizabeth. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us as well. Excellent. All right. It's also for the sake of conscience sake. So let me give you a couple of thoughts, and then we're going to look at Wyatt Graham's thoughts on this. Here's the broad strokes. Number one, government is given for our good. That's the first broad parameter that we need to understand. 
Romans chapter 13 and verse 4 said, For he is government, the governing authority, is your God's servant for your good. That means he is your God's servant for your good. So is he God's servant for your good. So is Mayor Tory God's servant for your good. So are they, policemen. Remember the Allison's barbecue incident? They are God's servants for your good. Bylaw officers handing out tickets, whether they're parking tickets or COVID safety protocol violations, they are God's servants for your good. Doesn't mean they always do good. Doesn't mean everything they do we agree with. The flat out statement is government exists for your good. I was looking up today on our own statement of faith here at the church, which is the Feb Central Statement of Faith. We believe that civil government is of divine appointment for the interest and good order of society, that magistrates are to be prayed for, conscientiously obeyed and honored and obeyed, except only in the things opposed to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Lord of the conscience and Prince of the Kings of the earth. Even our own statement of faith says that's how we believe. Adam, you're in Calgary tonight? Hey, brother. Adam is a buddy of mine from Thunder Bay, now lives outside of Sudbury, and he is a... It's WestJet, right, Adam? Boy, if it's Air Canada, you're going to string me up. I'm pretty sure it's a WestJet pilot, and it looks like he's out in Calgary tonight. That's great. He's off and tuning in. I was thinking of you today, brother, as we were planning this, so thanks for joining us. Government is in place for our good. That's the first major category. Secondly, submission to government is for our good. Verse 3 says, do what is, what is good and you'll receive his approval. Submitting to government is for our good and we should expect good to come from us when we submit to them, when we obey them, when we comply. We have been making every, and it feels like additional efforts to comply with the safety protocols. When we came back in the summertime and when we come back in a few weeks, we hope we are making every effort to comply. I don't get it all. I don't always buy it all. I'm not sure I agree with all of it. What I agree with is they have the authority to put these things in place and we have a calling for our good. It's a good thing for us to comply with what the governing authorities are asking us. The very issue of submission, the concept of submission, we mentioned this before, but just to remind us, submission carries with it at its very essence an expectation that we're going to disagree. Hi, Emmy. Emmy, thank you for popping in. I know you worked so hard late in the evening there, and uh, that's good of you to pop in. Thank you, Emmy. I know that's a big deal for you. So submission includes the idea that we are going to, in fact, it encapsulates the idea, we're gonna disagree. You take the four key areas that submission is called for in the scriptures, husbands and wives, parents and children, elders and congregation, governments and citizens, those four areas, the expectation is, husbands and wives aren't always going to agree. Children are not going to want to do what their parents say. Congregations are not always going to see it the same way as their leaders. And citizens are not always going to be blessing the government. And so when it comes to submission, we have to understand not only is it for our good, but God expects that we will not believe what is best for us. We'll not believe that he knows what's best for us. He expects us not to believe it which is why he has to say, you gotta submit to it. It's not going to make sense. You don't have to call someone to submit to someone with whom they already agree, right? Parents don't tell their children, now you submit to me, and they go, yeah, daddy, I was already doing it. I already wanted to do it. Well, you don't have to even give direction. Never mind call for submission. But the whole idea, brothers and sisters, is is that when we are called to submit, of course we're not going to see it that way. Why else would God have to call us to submit to it? 
And so the, the great out, well, I don't think so. Well, I don't agree. Well, I don't think this works. I don't believe hand sanitizer is required. I don't think lockdowns work. I don't think we have to socially distance. Why is Costco open and the independent flower shop is not? Why do we have to wear masks? Why can't we sing in church? Why does the pastor have that plexiglass? Why can't we have everyone in here? Why? I get it, brothers and sisters. We've been through this. The expectation that comes with a call to submission is an expectation of disagreement. Therefore, God must call us to do it. And so that's, that's where we are. Two big ideas. Government is for our good. Submission to government is good. So let's give some thought here to the reality of living in light of Isaiah 9 verse 6, or 6 verse 9, that ultimately the government is on the shoulders of Christ. He is the one who's ultimately governing all of these things. And I say, friends, when you get that, when you see that, all right, I'll pay the parking meter. I'll keep the speed limit. I'll pay my taxes. I will do what they've called us to do because, well, it's God who's the ultimate governor of all of these things. Just trying to watch for everybody here. So let's try to see what Wyatt has to tell us here tonight. So here's the first thought. First thought that we have here is that an understanding that respect, sorry, Iris is coming on. Great. Iris, it should be right there. Yeah, it's not Zoom tonight. It's... Uh, on Facebook Live. I thought we might have had a little bit of difficulty there. Respect for government is respect for God. Our respect for government is respect for God. That's the one of his first thoughts here. Now turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Acts chapter 23. I found this very interesting. You, you expected tonight, when we were going to talk about government, that we go to Romans chapter 13. But the very reason I'm using Wyatt's material is because his comments on this, and it's a brief passage, but Romans cha or Acts chapter 23. Acts is a narrative account of the early church, of course. It is more descriptive than prescriptive, but that when there are things that are laid down as principles and they are affirmed later in the scriptures as well, then we look back and we go, okay, that is normative for the church. And so this is one of those examples. The Apostle Paul, of course, has in Acts chapter 20 laid out his life before the elders of the church of Ephesus on the, the beach at at. Uh, on, on the beach as he's on his way to, to Miletus, as he's on his way to go, he believes to Jerusalem and ultimately to Rome. It seems that he believes that he's going to ultimately give his life. And here's his first giving of his testimony in chapter 22 before the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And in chapter 23, you see his interaction because he's already appealed now to Caesar, so to speak. And the Romans are, are keeping him safe, as it were, and he's now before, again, the, the people, the religious leaders, and look what he says in chapter 23, verse 1 and following, looking intently at the council, Paul said, this is chapter 23, verse 1, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. When we talked about for the sake of conscience, learning how to live, the distinction between right and wrong, and living in integrity before that. He says, with that in mind, a good conscience up to this point. In verse 2, And the high priest Annas commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And apparently they did. So we pick it up in verse 3. Then Paul said to him, right? In, in verse 2, Ananias, the high priest, he speaks to him, God is going to strike you. You what? You whitewashed wall. Now, that may not sound like much of a curse to us, but this is an overtly derogatory statement to this one. He says that, that you're this whitewashed wall. You're going to strike me? God is going to strike you. Look at the irony. Are you sitting here to judge me according to the law and you order me to be struck? 
His, his inference is, rhetorically, is that you want to obey the law and you call me up here for not obeying the law and now you're going to go against the law by having them strike me because you don't like what my defense says. Now watch what turns here. Watch the turn. Verse 4. Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? Now I don't know exactly what the scene was like, but in these narrative accounts, you've got to crawl inside the scene, don't you? And you have this idea that he's there, he's standing up in front of people, and they're ready to strike him, and whether he's been struck or he's about to be, and the Apostle Paul throws his finger, and you think, who do you think you are, you whitewashed wall? And the whole place is quiet. No one is expecting or anticipating this kind of behavior from Paul. Why not? Because Ananias is a high priest. And they're not getting into an argument and a debate. No one calls him down, as it were, as much as it's this, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? Would you revile against God's high priest? And Paul said, I didn't know, brothers, that he was the high priest. I had no idea. Okay, everything stops. You know, sometimes you're in the middle of emotion and everybody's arguing over this and somebody says something so dumb or so penetrating, right? So hurtful and it just cuts through. And he's like, okay. But you just take a step back. But you just take a chill pill here, right? I had no idea who he was. I didn't know that he was a high priest. Why does that make a difference? For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now that's a quote from the book of Exodus chapter 22, which is this whole collection of interesting little, not tidbits, but almost proverb-like laws. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And Paul, now living under the new covenant times, quotes that truth, which means it's been brought over into our new covenant. Not that that law applies, but that concept is going to be brought into this new covenant. And Paul is saying, listen, if I had any idea who this was, I wouldn't have spoken like that. Ananias was wrong. Paul's on charges that he shouldn't be for. Paul's speaking the truth, being accused of lying. Paul's going to be unjustly struck because as a Roman citizen, Ananias had no position to be doing this. Wrong, 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 wrong. Hang on. What I just did was wrong. And Wyatt reminds us here, when scripture commands that you speak well of the body that helped crucify the Messiah, then you do it. Now, it's one of those mic drop moments, isn't it? <laughs> that's amazing to me. That, that still grips me, even as I'm just speaking to you here tonight. Think of the number of excuses of our kind of behavior, thought, word, and deed towards the government that would be just removed from the scene. You will not speak evil of the ruler of God's people, of a ruler, of a governor. You're not going to speak like that. Even though what you said is correct, that they don't have any right to strike you, even though his action was wrong, you have no place to strike him, even though God's judgment may indeed come on in the sense that you expect discipline for someone who's in sin, all those things have no correlation to the Apostle Paul to say it's okay for me to speak like this. Now just, just think for a second, brothers and sisters, the kind of things that come out of our hearts that flow from our mouths about the governing authorities today. I, I, I pulled this little plaque off of my, my desk. You probably can't read it. But it says, Lord, <laughs> K 
Keep your arm around my shoulder and your hand over my mouth. <laughs> I remember when I got this. Lord, keep your hand on my shoulder, your arm on my shoulder, and your hand over my mouth. Just guard my tongue, dear God. Guard me from saying such foolish things, from things coming out of my mouth. And when you keep me close to you, God, that's the solution. He's loving me like that, sacrificially, intimately, intentionally. Stay close to the Lord, and that's how we're going to govern these tongues of ours. Brothers and sisters, respect for the rulers is respect for God. That's the first thought. Secondly, submission to unjust authority is submission to God. Now, you see what we're doing. We're not taking the obvious thoughts here. Submission even to unjust authority is submission to God. Oh, you got in, Iris. Ah, good. Excellent. Thanks, Ron. Oh, good. Thanks, Renilo. Appreciate you helping her out there. That's great. Excellent stuff. And so, remember, friends, if there's a, you have a question of something we're saying, you can type it in, and I will... Stop as quickly as I can to answer the question for us. And so let me just go back here. Some of you have been, not been on this before. This is what we do, right? Take our time, try to make sure that we're connecting with everybody as best we can. Everybody who wants to get in, especially since we've been off been for a little while. This before. This is okay, what... good. We're still there. So this is our second thought. Submission to unjust authority is submission to God. And the last text is Acts chapter 23. This text is 1 Peter chapter 2. And this one's not on the screen, so you will need your Bible for this. Hebrews, James, Peter. First letter of Peter, chapter 2. Now my ministry verse is in verse 9. That you are a royal, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him, Him who's called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Now, Peter is giving some very practical instructions down in verse 13, where he says, Be subject for the Lord's sake for every human institution. That's the heading. But look down in particular at verse 18. I don't think I have it on the screen, do I? No. Good. So, Chapter 2, verse 18, submission to even unjust authorities is submission to God. Verse 18 says, servants, in this whole context here, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Showing respect to unjust rulers is showing respect to the God who's called you to show respect to unjust rulers, masters, governing authorities over your life. And somebody says, well, that's for servants. That's not for all people. Are you kidding me? The way servants were thought of and treated and dealt with in this time of antiquity, brothers and sisters, this is absolute authority over their lives, far more than you and I think we're even putting up with. So even not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. For, why would you do this? For, why would you call me to this, Lord? Because, for, because this is a gracious thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Wow. It's a reflection of grace when you're doing it for the sake of the one who's called you to do it that's who's called you to do it god with god in mind when you endure sorrow and suffering unjustly this isn't fair i know that's 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 a given i'm talking about unfair well that's not right i know we've that's that's a given it's not right this is not just way for people to be treated. I know. That's what we're talking about. It's not an excuse not to obey this. Not an excuse not to submit to this, brothers and sisters. Look what Peter's saying. Verse 20. For, look at the logic here. 
What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? Well, I get beat up all the time. Well, because maybe you're a jerk all the time. Maybe you don't hold your tongue all the time. Maybe you deserve it from a human standpoint. And he says, what credit is to you when you sin and there's consequences and you endure it? There's no credit to you. And so he says, look in verse 21. Uh, verse second part of verse 20. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now, you notice a minute ago, he said, when you're mindful of God, it's a gracious thing. It's in the sight of God. When you're thinking about God, it's a, it's a gracious thing. When God is looking at you, watching you, observing you, seeing what's going on, I know I'm with you. I am with you. I am with you in this. It's a gracious thing thing. For to this you have been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. You know, even the non-Christian world believes Jesus is a good example, isn't he? He's a good teacher. He's a very moral man. He's a real person, an example of integrity. He says, listen, for to this you have been called. Sometimes I have to back up in my Christian calling and say, have, have, is my calling so uniquely different than the way I'm living? Because all it takes for me to have a full stop in my Christian walk is if things aren't going easy and simple and just. Fulfill your calling. Walk in a manner consistent with your calling, Ephesians 4.1 tells us. Well, what's he saying here? To this you've been called. Look how he explains it. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He went, and we go where our Savior went. He did this, and we follow where our Lord leads. And we follow and seek to act the way that he led, the way that he lived. It says, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. What, what kind of example did he set? Look at verse 22. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but kept entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Hmm. In fact, it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Remember who we were, brothers and sisters. Remember that we were people that were on our way, straying, wandering away on our own. And, and left to ourselves, we would never turn back to the path of good, healthy, nourishment, righteousness, safety, all of those comfort things that we're looking for. He says, you were straying like sheep, but now have returned. Why have you returned? Because he came and brought us back. By his wounds, we've been healed. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. It's not fair. We don't look at the cross very often and scream, it's not fair. We say, it's wonderful. In this, God displays his love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verse 8. That's true. Why don't we scream unfair? Why don't we scream awful, ugly, heinous? The sin of sins in the history of the planet is the sinless Lamb of God on the cross. He did that, even though it was just that unfair, just that unjust. And he says, to this you've been called. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When he suffered, he did not utter threats. Isn't that what we do? When we get reprimanded, whether it's just verbally or even through the courts, 
I'm going to get, you're going to do, you're going to pay, just wait and see what happens. He uttered no threats. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Remember, that's the same word that's used when the Apostle Paul is accused of reviling God's high priest. It's a revulsion. And he says that you've been called even to submit in this kind of circumstance. Respect for unjust authorities is respect to God. Wyatt puts it this way. John Calvin and the magisterial reformers as well see this as a must because no one can truly just can be truly just in this life what they're getting at is if you're only going to submit to a totally just authority then you're not going to submit to anybody and what's the result going to be the opposite is anarchy and anarchy is worse than an overbearing government anarchy means a law unto myself i'll just do what i want well how often does that happen all the time. Why is it taking so long for this pandemic to get under control? Because there's good reason upon good reason upon good reason upon good excuse upon an understandable and this is important and this was special and I'm not going to miss and I'm going to be at and I'm going to see and I've got to go and I've already paid for and I put the down payment down. Right? I've used those excuses, so have you. And yet, what, what are we saying? I'm only going to submit to totally just governments. The history of our fellowshipping, our end of Protestantism, is saying if you're not going to submit to an unjust ruler, you're not going to submit to anybody, and you're just going to be an anarchist. Those are horrible words when they were used around the, the U.S. Capitol riots a month ago, weren't they? Why, what were they doing? They didn't care what the law said, what the court said, what the legislature said, they were going to get their own way. You can blame whoever you want for that. Look at the people themselves that took those actions. And then look, brothers and sisters, how easy it is to see ourselves in that. To disrespect an unjust government is to disrespect the God who has called you to respect the unjust government. This is, these are such broad strokes and somebody had asked me today when we were putting this together like you know we're coming out of the pandemic why are you laboring this whole issue with government because we got to be equipped number one I think this is probably going to last longer than most of us think I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet and I work for a non-profit organization as Don Carson puts it but I think this may be a while I think summer is going to look different than last summer. I hope Christmas looks different than last year. It'll probably look different, but it might be a lot closer to last Christmas than the one before. This may take some time, brothers and sisters. And the longer it goes, the more frustration is built. And, and the longer the frustration is built, the more eager we are to have it just explode. And the excuse will be, this isn't right. You know, it's, it's so hard for us to see the rightness even in something that's imperfect. I, I have dear friends who are saying things like, well, why are the big box stores open and the small guys can't be open? Well, the big box store being open is helping the economy in which the little guy is operating. I know it's not exactly the same thing. and I'm not saying there isn't a cost and a, and a tremendous cost, and maybe the decision should be different. But look at the good. Why are the grocery stores open? Why are the big box stores open? Why are those, those giant you know, lineups at Walmart? Can you think of the tens of thousands of people that still have jobs, that are paying taxes, that are keeping our economy going, that is paying for the kind of services, Serb or elsewise, that are caring for those? who are hurting because their shops are closed. It's so difficult to see that because it's not perfect. And I agree it's not perfect. Don't get me wrong. But what gets missed is the advantages of living in a society where the economy continues to move forward. And at least those are open. At least those things are moving forward. At least there's some opportunity 
to continue to move this economy forward, which is a benefit from all of us, to all of us in society. The same reason we're asking everyone to obey certain safety protocols is because it benefits everyone. And you might say, well, it doesn't matter. It matters if the people around us matter. And if the people around us matter, they will matter because we are Christians for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so submission, even to unjust authorities, respect to unjust authorities is respect to God. Let's look at this last one. And the church is therefore called to submit to the state. Yes, that's a calling upon the church's lives. Remember back in Romans chapter 13, verse 1? Let every person, every person, be subject to the governing authorities. God gives the government of mankind authority over all of us. Christian or not, yes, they can arrest you. Yes, they can punish you for evil. No, it's not okay because you disagree to go ahead and frankly disobey them while endangering your communities, whether you're in Elmer or St. Jacob's, St. Catharines, Niagara area, wherever these things are happening, and they're happening in Toronto. Dear friends of ours that are doing this, and I get it, some of these things are conscience issues by legitimate Christian folks. And some, the longer it goes on, the more you listen. It's as if the state can't tell us anything. Friends, we don't buy that. Not at Downsview Baptist Church. We have a chairlift that no one uses. And twice a year, we pay. Hey, Grant? <laughs> we pay to have that thing inspect, inspected so that it works well. Because why? The governing authorities tell us to do that. We are revamping, and we're just about done, our whole fire safety plan here. Replacing light bulbs, replacing exit signs, replacing smoke detectors, replacing fire extinguishers, all kinds of stuff, because we didn't think they were a problem. But there's laws that tell us we have to do that. Of course we can't jam 500 people into our auditorium, because the fire marshal will tell us it's not safe, and we believe that. We want certain electrical safety standards. When Vit and Ark and, the, and Ivan and the gang did these renos around here, we got proper permits. They did it with proper safety measures in mind. You know me, I'm not very handy with those kind of things. But they did it according to the code. Code says, why? Because we believe that the civil authorities have every right to, quote, impose those laws upon us here at the church. We pay our taxes. We pay payroll taxes. We submit things to the government every single year. Emmy, you do that all the time. Andre, Colleen, help. We do that because we have to do those things. I get a T4 slip because I report it to CRA. We believe that the government has authority over the church. Not about the, the content or the method of our worship. That's very different. That's very different. And that's not what we've dealt with, brothers and sisters. It's been a medical issue that has caused us to refrain from singing for a season. Not because the government is saying you can sing in the nightclubs and the bars, but you can't sing in churches. It's all been shut down because it's a medical decision. That's one of the key aspects of why we're saying we will comply also even if we don't think it's right because it is fair, <laughs> it is just across the board, but the state has the place to call us to submit to its civil regulations. And so brothers and sisters, as we wrap up for the evening, it's important that you and I get this as these broad strokes in our mind, that we begin from the position the government can tell us. Yes, they can. Yes, they can require. Because God set up those authorities. There is no authority except that which has been established by God and those which exist have been instituted by God. 
There's great liberty there. There's great liberty there. There's joy there. There's relax, okay? You don't even have to think hard about it. Just default to say, all right, God's got this. This God, who by the foreknowledge and determining counsel of God would send his son into this world, not because we were asking for him, not because we were pleading with God to send a savior. We were in a world that we were happy to move in the way we were going, in the intensity we were going, in the direction we were going, in the method that we were living. We were just happy. I don't want God. Oh, you want to save me and take me to heaven? Sure. Nobody talked about this lordship. And so he humbles himself, taking the form of the servant to come and to serve you and I as rebellious, self-absorbed, self-reliant, self-impressed sinners like me. He lived the life we should have lived. He died the death that I had owed and that I had earned. And he said, I will transfer my righteousness to your account when you trust me. And your debt has now been paid. Trust me. Surrender to me. Live for me and show me that you've surrendered to me. I've told you these things so that my joy would be in you and your joy would be full. Remember, friends, the path of sanctification on the road with Christ is a path to our joy. Let's pray. Father, we end our evening tonight with thanksgiving and with joy and with encouragement about and because of your word. I pray, dear God, for each one who has listened tonight, who has participated tonight, who've just been here and, and seen one another's faces even on the just a the, the little screen there with a little picture of, of each one. It's just a good to connect even this way. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will keep us, you will protect us, and that you will, I pray, dear God, join us together, as it were, online on Sunday morning to the glory of our King. We pray in his name. Amen. It's good to be with you again, friends. Cheers.